technical testimony and as a part of that i'll be introducing a hearing exhibit so i would like to have the staff uh, pass it out now okay so you're not making the motion now you're just dispersing it now I, I will move to admit it when when i get to it in my discussion with mr benz appreciate you dispersing it thank you Should, should we, do you swear the witness in first or do I introduce him? I was gonna, but all right, thank you. Mr. Benz, uh, I think you've seen how we do this, so go ahead, make yourself comfortable, make sure you're talking into the mic. Okay. Uh, go ahead and raise your right mm -hmm. hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to provide is true and accurate? Yes, I do. Thank you. Mr. Long? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Benz, for the record, please state your name and place of employment. And, and your position. My name is Scott Bentz. I'm a utility regulation engineer with the Office of Consumer Advocate. Thank you. And did you file, in this case, pre-file direct testimony and your Exhibit 1? Yes, I did. Do you have any corrections to the pre-file direct testimony or Exhibit? No, I do not. And would the answer stated in, in there be correct uh, if I asked them to you today? Yes. Thank you. And did you have an opportunity to review the rebuttal, the rebuttal testimony uh, submitted by some of its witnesses, and in particular, Mr. DeJoya? Yes, I did. Thank you. Um, have you been provided a copy of what is more, what is OCA response to OCA data request 69? Yes, I have. Thank you. And is this a data request that OCA sent to Summit uh, to ask questions about Mr. Jujoya's rebuttal testimony? Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, I would now move admission of, I think this is, I think we're at OCA hearing exhibit four. Are there objections? No objection, Your Honor. Seeing no objections, the board will admit OCA hearing exhibit four. Thank you, and now I'm going to ask Mr. Bentz briefly about this topic in, again, in response to Mr. Joy's testimony, rebuttal testimony. Just a quick reminder, Mr. Long, we do need to keep the cross limited. Thank you. Mr. Bentz, now having seen Mr. Joy's rebuttal testimony and this response, uh, to our data request, um, and also having reviewed the testimony, did you also review the testimony of the county's witness who addressed wet conditions? Yes, I reviewed the county's witness, Liebman's testimony. Do you, do you have any thoughts or recommendations based on having the benefit of both of those uh, additional test pieces of testimony regarding the, the wet soil conditions issue? I think that uh, from OCA's perspective, we are looking for a definition of wet conditions that is objective and repeatable uh, so that two different people performing the same test for wet conditions can come to the same result. My understanding from reviewing the testimony and listening to the hearing is that the ball test appears to be a somewhat more conservative uh, means of testing soil, where, meaning it's more likely to identify wet conditions as compared to Summit Witness DeJoya's uh, uh, recommendation to use 30% standing water in the right of way or less. So perhaps a compromise solution would be to uh, use the ball test before removing the topsoil and in the interest and then once the trench has been dug uh, 
in the interest of getting the soil back in there as quickly as possible to avoid uh, erosion and degradation of microbial activity, like uh, witness DeJoya discussed, uh, they could switch to using the 30% uh, standing water methodology. But again, I would like to hear uh, witness Liebman discuss it further as well. Thank you. With that, uh, with, with appreciation for uh, allowing us that addi brief additional direct, I now offer this witness for cross-examination. Thank you. Mr. Long, did you want to admit his testimony and exhibits as well? Yes. Sorry, I, I would also like to move admission of Mr. Bent's direct testimony, and I believe his only exhibit is his direct exhibit one. All right. Is there objection? Seeing none, the board will admit. Now, we'll take it. Does anyone have questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Eisenhardt actually had his flag up first, so. We'll get you. Go ahead, Representative Eisenhardt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, can I be heard, Mr. Benz, easily? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> a number of questions I want to ask around the question of public interest, public convenience, public necessity that are covered in your testimony. Iowa Code authorizes the OCA to represent the interests of utility consumers generally and the public generally in all proceedings before the board, correct? That is my understanding, yes. Is that an exclusive franchise? I'm sorry. Is sorry what? to use a term you're not familiar with in another context. Is OCA the only intervener that may represent the interests of consumers and the public generally? My understanding is that we are the only entity that does that. The only entity, but is it, does the, does the law say that no other interveners may represent the interests of consumers or, or the public? Or speak to, if you want to use that word. Uh, I'm not an attorney, but uh, I don't think we are the only entity allowed to represent. Thank you. The That's public. what I was getting at. Does OCA consider the Summit Pipeline permit application as being in litigation? That sounds like a legal term, and I'm an engineer, so. I don't think I can give you a good answer okay. to that question. Is it OCA policy to not communicate with or consult with the public or other parties representing interests the public may have on contested cases before the board because such cases are considered to be in litigation? Uh, I'm going to I'm going to object on relevance grounds, because I think this is outside of the scope of Mr. Benz's testimony. Representative Eisenhardt, can you? We'll uh, skip the answer to that question. In part, I'm creating some foundation here for some future discussions. Um, but I would say that Mr. Benz is the only witness for the OCA, and given the wide scope of the OCA's responsibility, I'm hoping he'll be able to respond on behalf of the consumer advocate on at least some of these questions. In preparing your testimony, you reviewed documents filed in the docket and discovery materials provided to OCA, correct? That is correct. What other steps has the OCA taken to identify the interests of the public generally in this pipeline proposal? We've also, in addition to the filings, uh, we've reviewed the objections and the comments and issue data requests of the public objections filed by the public yes so that's included in your review of the documents yes but no other ac actions outside of that review in terms of communicating with the public generally not that I can think of no thank you OCA has a consumer advisory panel I would I would like to remind Representative Eisenhardt that Mr. Benz can answer for his own experience, but and his own experience and knowledge, but he can't be aware of everything anyone in the OCA is doing. 
And so I would ask Mr. Representative Eisenhart to frame his questions accordingly. I would say if the witness doesn't have an answer to the question based on that, then he could just say so, and I, and I would move on. Okay. Let's try to keep our questions limited to the context of the witness's testimony. Uh, Mr. Benz, I'm going to attempt a general analysis of who public stakeholders are with respect to this case. Again, getting at public convenience and necessity, which you testified to. And I'm not asking you to agree with me or embrace my analysis. Just ask if you think my analysis is fair. Uh, we have members of the public with a direct interest, those with an indirect interest, and those with neither a direct or personal interest. Is that fair? That sounds reasonable. So, for example, again, not asking you to agree or even trying to be exhaustive, just asking if I'm being fair. Summit has a direct interest. 13 ethanol companies have a direct interest. Landowners approached for easements. Counties where roads are impacted. Some railroads where there's crossings. Those are examples of folks who are directly impacted there. That seems fair. Uh, people with an indirect interest, maybe corn farmers, construction companies, and workers who might be called upon to build a pipeline, people who might be hired by Summit to operate a pipeline, maybe even people who drive gas and ethanol-powered vehicles in California. Examples of folks who may have an indirect interest, is that fair? That seems fair. Uh, Chickasaw County, which is more than 100 miles away from Dubuque County, is the closest the Summit Pipeline is proposed to go relative to House District 72, which is my district. Unless someone in Dubuque County falls into one of the first two categories, and I can't say off the top of my head who they might be, most of the people in House District 72, my district, the public generally, would probably fall into that third category, neither directly or indirectly directly impacted by the Summit Pipeline Fair. That seems fair. Okay. A quick interjection. Uh, the Navigator Greenway project is proposed to come to Delaware County, just west of Dubuque. Corn farmers in the area, county emergency management personnel would probably be impacted by that project. Folks concerned about that project think that the outcome of this project the Summit Pipeline application will create a precedent that will affect the prospects of the Navigator project for a possible later approval. Is that a fair observation? Do you think that feeling is out there among people? That seems fair. Okay. So people who are not directly or indirectly impacted by the pot, this project may be indirectly or directly impacted by similar projects in the future. Correct. Correct. For the general public, not directly or indirectly impacted by this project, what are the convenience and necessity factors that OCA believes the board should consider? I think in terms of public convenience and necessity, the board needs to consider the items that Summit listed in their Exhibit E which I listed in my direct testimony. Any factors that OCA believe should be considered outside of those? Beyond what I listed there, uh, we did not identify additional uh, factors of public convenience and necessity. To your knowledge, uh Again, you can answer no if you'd like. Does the state of Iowa have any statutes, administrative rules, public policies, session law that would prioritize or otherwise support the capture, transportation, and sequestration of industrial carbon emissions? I'm not aware of specific policies with that. Would the existence or non-existence of such statutes or policies be relevant to a determination that a carbon dioxide, dioxide pipeline has a public convenience or necessity? Would such policy be relevant to this case? Was that your question? Yes. I, I think that would be relevant, yes. On page six of your testimony, you asked the board to carefully review the project's revenue sources. I don't know if you want to put that up there just 
for usefulness. To date, does OCA believe the applicant has provided the information necessary for that review? I think that since the filing of my direct testimony, uh, some additional information has come up regarding in this hearing, for example, the lifespan of the 45Q tax credits. Uh, my understanding is that they last for 12 years. In addition to that, the low carbon fuel markets that Summit has identified uh, so far, California, Oregon, Washington State, and I think British Columbia. My understanding is that those same locations also have put plans in place to ban the sale of motor vehicles, uh, California, Oregon, and Washington State by 2035, British Columbia by 2040. So it seems like those are factors that should be relevant to the board's uh, consideration of public convenience and necessity as well. So do you believe the board has all the information necessary for that purpose? I don't know if they have all the information. I think that this hearing is part of the board's process of gathering information. Thank you. Uh, starting on page seven, you discuss possible use of alternative routes. Um, starting on page nine, you discuss inconvenience and undue injury. And later on page 22, you recommend that the board use a balancing test to weigh the public benefits of the proposed project against the public and private costs or other detriments of the project. So I've combined those three pieces in order to ask this question. If carbon dioxide, uh, if carbon dioxide sequestration were geologically feasible in Iowa and alternative routes could be established to get CO2 to injection wells in Iowa, which would hypothetically eliminate or minimize inconvenience, undue injury, or other detriments of a long-distance pipeline, does OCA believe that the board could require Summit to prove that such an alternative is not feasible before concluding that the current proposal is a public necessity? I'm going to ask for a reference to Mr. Bent's pre-filed testimony and exhibits so that the question, Mr. Bentz can see the question in the context of what he's already testified to. Um, part, page seven discusses possible use of alternative routes. I think it starts at the bottom. I'm not going to object at this time. If the witness knows, he can answer. Does the OCA believe that the board could require Summit to prove that such an alternative is not feasible before concluding that the current proposal is a public necessity? Just so I understand, this question is premised on a hypothetical of CO2 being able to be sequestered in Iowa? Right now, we don't know. There would need to be additional research. So I guess, yes, at this time, it's hypothetical. I'm not even sure how to answer that. I, the, I'm, I'm aware of a survey being done by the Iowa Geological Survey, a report filed by them that says that the bedrock hasn't been characterized yet in Iowa, so it's unknown at this time. I understand if OCA may not have an answer at this time, planting that seed, perhaps for future consideration. On page 20, you directly address public convenience and necessity. You note that Summit Exhibit F appears to identify that their project, in part, will achieve such ends by, quote, in your testimony, sequestering carbon for the purposes of combating climate change, correct? Uh, yes, that was identified in Summit's Exhibit okay. F. 
So I would note that Exhibit F, you can bring this up if you'd like, actually is worded to refer to, quote, reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the effort to combat climate change. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions, not sequestering carbon. Uh, you can trust me on that, or we can look at some at this Exhibit F for, for purposes of my next couple questions. Your testimony does not directly, your direct testimony does not address the claim related to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. When asked, do you have comments on the other areas which SCS asserts, this project promotes the public convenience and necessity, you responded, not at this time. Why does OCA not address, or are you, will you in the future be addressing the claim regarding reducing greenhouse gas emissions as part of a justification for public necessity? Since the filing of my direct testimony, I don't have additional study that we've done on that topic. I think, though, that I did say further down in my testimony that we may uh, discuss that in briefs. Okay. Has OCA, in its data requests, asked for comp the information you just said you don't have? Have you asked for comprehensive information on net reduction of atmospheric emissions resulting from the project, including construction and operation of the capture and sequestration facilities? I believe that one or two of our data requests may have uh, asked about this, but I, I don't recall specifically which they were, and I don't believe they were included in my Exhibit 1. So if that information was requested, you can't speak at this moment about what it may show. That's correct. Mr. Powell testified that Summit Carbon Solutions does not have a position on climate change. Does that, is that statement affect OCA's analysis or evaluation of the claim regarding reducing greenhouse gas emissions as it pertains to public convenience and necessity? I don't think that affected anything in my analysis, no. We well, made that statement after you submitted your testimony, so would it change anything, I guess? I don't think it would, no. Mr. Paroli, in response to a question by Mr. Taylor, testified that capture, transportation, and sequestration of CO2 by summit would not prevent the emission of CO2 into the atmosphere by ethanol facilities. Does that statement affect OCA's analysis or evaluation of the claim regarding reducing greenhouse gas emissions? I'm not completely certain. Objection, Your Honor. That, That's your objection. That significantly mischaracterizes Mr. Paroli's uh, testimony, and I apologize for stepping on Mr. Leonard's witness, but Mr. Paroli was my witness. Yes. Uh, he said that it would not capture the post-combustion emissions from uh, fuels that are powering the ethanol plant, but it would in fact uh, prevent the atmosphere, the uh, fermentation CO2, which is the much, much larger quantity from reaching the atmosphere. Representative Eisner, you respond. Well, you, well, thank you. We can go back and, and look at what his statements actually were. And I was about to say that maybe he didn't meant it the way I heard it. Um, so I'll change, I'll rephrase the question if that works. Hold on a moment. Before you proceed, just a quick reminder that we would appreciate you confining your uh, cross to questions. 
questions uh, related to the testimony. Thank, Thank you. you. And the testimony discusses public convenience and necessity. I'm asking for elaboration. Um, my guess is that your answer to that question would probably be similar to the, the previous question. At the top of page 21, you reference Summit's assertion that the safety of transporting carbon dioxide by pipeline compared with rail and truck transport would support a board finding of public convenience and necessity. To your knowledge, is any entity in Iowa proposing to transport by rail 9.5 million or more metric tons of CO2 captured at ethanol facilities? Not to my knowledge, no. To your knowledge, is any entity in Iowa proposing to transport by truck 9.5 million or more metric tons of CO2 captured at ethanol facilities? Not to my knowledge, no. So given that, the statement that the proposed pipeline is safer relative to options that aren't being considered uh, transportation alternatives, is that a meaningful claim to support public convenience and necessity? Your Honor, I, in, in this, if we can scroll up to the next page, in, in this portion of the witness's testimony, he's again just referring to what Summit said in their Exhibit F. Um, and I believe the questions are framed as if the witness is endorsing each of these views, and I don't believe that that's, I don't believe that that's a correct reading of his pre-filed testimony. Representative Eisenhower, can you rephrase your question? Well, I'm not saying that's his testimony. I'm just asking for the OCA's purpose, in behalf of the public, evaluating public convenience and necessity is the form of transportation a meaningful benefit to the public, given the fact that the alternatives that it's being compared to aren't real? I think that that question, I think that question implies uh, an all or nothing proposition. Uh, transporting nine million metric tons by pipe versus transporting all nine million metric tons by rail or truck. There's also possibilities of some sort of hybrid transportation methodology where some ethanol plants could transport by a rail or truck to a central location to be loaded onto a pipeline. But we didn't we didn't do additional analysis and I don't have additional positions on that particular aspect of uh, uh, summits exhibit F. Thank you. On uh, page nine, you discuss preemption. Uh, yesterday, I spoke with some farmers who are here from Crawford County, whose supervisors want to but have declined to pass a setback ordinance because they're afraid of getting sued. <laughs> OCA states in its testimony that as of July 24th, it has no position on the issue of preemption and continues to monitor the issue. Does OCA have a position now? I don't believe we have a position on that. Uh, that falls more on the legal side of things outside of engineering. Would recognizing the legitimacy of reasonable ordinances passed by counties to provide for public safety in relation to the pipeline, would that make the project more or less convenient to the public? That sounds more like a legal question as well, but I'm not qualified to answer. I guess I'm going for the OCA's definition of public convenience more than a legal question. Public convenience and necessity as it relates to zoning law? Am I understanding that right? As it relates to building support in the local counties, would people find it more or less convenient if they knew that they could provide for some safety measures of their own? I, I don't think I'm qualified to answer that, sorry. Thank you. On page 15, you cover cost recovery. 
stating that you have no objection to the project cost or the recovery mechanism because the cost will not be passed on to persons the testimony refers to as Iowa rate payers. Now we understand that a large share of the cost will be covered or recovered through federal tax credits. Are the 45Q and 45Z tax credits covered in part by Iowa taxpayers? Uh, yeah, I think they would be. Is the consumer advocate concerned that Iowa taxpayers uh, would be paying in part for an expensive project um, that may or may not have the benefit that the federal government is willing to pay for through those programs? I object. State your objection. Um, let me gather my thoughts about where to begin. Um, first, he doesn't he doesn't testify about the public policy. The, he does not express an opinion in his pre-filed testimony about whether the federal law providing the tax credits is good or bad. And um, so the question is, is outside of the scope of his pre-filed testimony. Representative Eisenhower, do you have a response? On page 15, at the top line three, it says OCA, which is not just Mr. Bantz, but his testimony represents OCA, has no objection to the project cost or the recovery mechanism. And I'm asking whether or not whether or not they decided to have no objection included an evaluation of these other factors. He can, he can, if, if he has an answer, he can provide one. The witness can answer to the extent he has knowledge to the rephrasing after the very limited rephrase of Representative Eisenhower's question. We did not perform an analysis of the effect of 45 to tax credits on Iowans. Thank you. I'm down to my last two questions. Very broad what we can expect in the future. In its final briefs to the board on this matter, to your knowledge, will the consumer advocate be making its own declarative statements on the public benefits as well as the public and private detriments of this project? so the board can take those views into account in making its decision. At this time, I don't know. Thank you. Will the OCA in its final brief on behalf of the public be making its own statement on whether or not this project has meets the statutory requirement of being convenient or necessary to the public? Is that different than public convenience and necessity? No then my answer is the same as before. I don't know. Thank you, Mr. Bentz. I appreciate your patience. And the chairs. Are you done? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Are there any other questions? Hold on. Ms. Ryan, I'm sorry, did you have your tent up? I can't always see around Mr. Whipple. There, now I see it. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Benz. Good afternoon. I just have a couple of quick questions for you. Um, on page 21 of your testimony, you uh, state that the examples cited by SCS appear to be positive economic benefits for Iowa. I'll wait a moment for that to get there. Yes. Are you an economist? No, I'm not. Do you have a position on whether or not those e apparent economic benefits satisfy the legal standards for I, eminent I'm, domain? I'm, 
I'm going to object. State your objection. I, I refer to our outstanding motion. Um, Ms. Ryan worked on preparing the case with Mr. Bentz while she was an attorney for OCA. And I have very significant concerns about her questioning uh, the witness because we would have no way of knowing uh, that legal strategy and other privileged and confidential attorney representation information and materials weren't being used in the cross. May I respond, Your Honor? Yes. Mr. Bent's testimony was entirely prepared after my departure from OCA. I had no uh, input into this, you know, what he stated in this testimony. Additionally, Mr. Long objected before I even finished the question. I think it would be appropriate for me to ask the question and see if it's objectionable. You can finish the question and then the board will address the objection before you answer. And this is my last question, just for reference. Um, my question is to Mr. Benz, are you taking a position on whether or not those apparent economic benefits are sufficient to meet the legal standard for eminent domain? Don't answer. Okay. John, does your objection still stand? Okay. Thank you. Uh, an objection of this gravity, the board's going to take five minutes to discuss off stage. Sit tight. Thank you. Um, the 
board is aware of the order uh, and will address um, and will be addressing the order soon. Um, but at this time, we will move on to Ms. Grunhagen. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Mr. Benz. I just have a couple of very quick clarifying questions. Sure. On uh, page 12 of your testimony, um, if the staff could bring that up. You asked a question on line three regarding inconvenience and in, in undue in, injury, and then you discuss um, some of the um, the number of miles of pipeline in the United States, including the number of miles of carbon dioxide. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, do you know how many miles is proposed by uh, Summit Carbon Solutions for this pro for the entire project across the five states? Across five states, no, I don't know exactly. Would it, would it be over 1,900 miles approximately? That sounds about right. And 688 of it is in the state of Iowa? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. Um, of the 5,000 miles of carbon dioxide pipelines that are already in the United States, are any of those located in um, prime row crop ground? I don't know for sure because I didn't check locations for all those pipelines. I know that some of them are located in West Texas, so I don't I, I don't know. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Yes, thank you, sir. How long have you been at the OCA? I think it is about getting close to five years now. Okay, so I think you would have missed the Dakota Access um, hearings then, is that fair? Yes, I was working at the IUB at that time, but not on the Dakota Access pipeline. And so have you ever testified on behalf of OCA in any docket? Yes, I've testified on behalf of OCA in other dockets. Uh, it has there been a docket in your uh, tenure that uh, presented only a single witness of OCA like is the case here? For, yeah, it's not unusual for some cases, electric transmission lines, uh, smaller pipelines. Sometimes I'm the only witness. Would you agree it's a bit unusual for a first ever of its kind uh, pipeline that proposes to be the largest on planet Earth? Um, put forth by an operator that doesn't own or operate a single pipeline, let alone a CO2 pipeline, that you are the one and only witness called here on behalf of the consumers? That probably is a little unusual, yes. You'd say that um, in reference to, to Summit's claims, the methodology regarding routing that they seem to cons consider alternative routes. Were you here during Mr. Skuvenek's testimony where he said, quote, the route is the route, end quote? I was watching remotely. I don't recall that uh, specific statement, but I did watch his testimony. Well, assume for a moment that a summit witness testified under oath that the route is the route, essentially that there won't be any any changes other than micro routing, which is to date an undefined term. Uh, would you like to amend your statement that Summit is continuing to consider alternative routes? Can we bring up my direct testimony so I can see where I said that? And yep, this is on page eight in the middle. So lines 10 to 15 on what we have on the screen. Um, I'm, I'm, sir, I'm looking at lines 7 through 8. Okay. Uh, 
I think that that statement um, regarding that they've they're considered alternate routes is based on the routing software they used to generate a, I think a high level or a rough route. Um, and I think in lines 10 to 15, I discussed the need to perform additional routing changes by the board, um, what they might, might be termed as micro routing, but to make adjustments uh, for individual landowners based on their needs. So does your testimony include um, route changes, for instance, around or to avoid Charles City or other um, municipalities that the, the route comes in contact with? I think that the board has the ability to consider re requiring those changes, yes. Okay, and, and my question was different. Have you considered the need or do you have an opinion that it would be reasonable to require rerouting around, for instance, Charles City or similar similar situated municipalities where the pipeline is in close proximity? I think it would be reasonable for the board to consider that, yes. Have you considered at all the effects on public inconvenience and necessity of the use of water to the tune of hundreds of millions of gallons a year that Summit would need uh, for cooling purposes at each of the ethanol or CO2 emitter plants that it would that would connect to its network? The water usage issue is one that I believe we just learned about last week at the hearing. Uh, we had not found out about that in any of the filings. And so we are, we're still considering that issue, but I think it's, uh, can be relevant to the board's consideration of public convenience and necessity. In terms of the draw of electricity that will be needed by the, um, capture facilities or the offtake facilities at every location and simply the pump stations and the ordinary course of operation of the pipeline. Do you have any concern uh, as to the electrical capacity or the grid or the pricing of, of energy and how it might affect consumers? In terms of effects of the electrical draw, I don't really have any concerns. Um, they would be considered a large electrical customer and typically with an electric utility, they would be required to pay for the electrical transmission system upgrades necessary in order to uh, get that additional power that they need at the plants. And those costs are directly assigned to the customer. And and what about, has Iowa experienced in, in, in your history in the state uh, ever any like blackouts or rolling blackouts or draws on the grid such where folks were um, requested to not um, utilize energy? Do you recollect any experiences like that? I can certainly recall instances of blackouts, um, specifically the derecho in August 2020. Um, in terms of appeals to the public to reduce power usage, I think those are typically pretty uncommon. You've, you've heard of those type of appeals in California or, or other places, right, across yes, the country? Yes, definitely right. in Texas and California. You discuss the concept or the issue of safety, um, and uh, you state on the top of page 13 that the record is incomplete in this area, and that being safety in relation to the analysis of convenience and undue injury. Do you stand by that statement? Yes, I think so. And were you able to be present in the confidential um, setting, the confidential testimony that was conducted today of Mr. Brian Locke, Locke, Luke, sorry, Mr. Luke of Summit? I was not present during the closed session for that. And given that Summit has refused to provide publicly or to designate in any other fashion other than attorney's eyes only its dispersion modeling and plume 
analysis and hazard distances, would you agree that until Bossier was able to fully analyze that data, that it would not be able to make an opinion that Summit would satisfy the public convenience and necessity in terms of the safety requirement? I think that uh, OCA should review the PUN models um, pr prior to filing our briefs. And, and that's because you would agree on behalf of the OCA that review of the plume model and the hazard distances would be an important consideration in analyzing whether or not this proposed project is in the public convenience and necessity. I'm not sure. I think they're relevant for the public convenience and necessity, but I think they can be useful for the board in determining whether or not to make routing changes. Okay, uh, and my question was a bit different. What do you believe from the standpoint of the Office of Consumer Advocate that review of specific distances and hazard levels and hazard distances is important to inform the OCA's opinion on whether or not this particular project um, is publicly convenient or necessary? I don't know. Um, I think there could be some useful information there with, with regards to public convenience and, and necessity, but we would need to make that decision still. Much of your testimony is simply rephrasing what Summit says and then adding a sentence or two um, of your thoughts based on accepting what Summit says as fact. Do you? challenge, you meaning the OCA, challenge any of the assertions of Summit, um, or did you accept them all as true and then respond accordingly? I think there are parts in my testimony where we do challenge some of the Summit's assertions, um, specifically with regard to construction in wet conditions, um, and then also under the public convenience and necessity as well. Well, and that's right where I was going. I mean, does OCA buy into this concept that if we build a hazardous pipeline hundreds of miles across Iowa and thousands of miles across the Midwest, that it's somehow a benefit to Iowa if a handful of ethanol plants may possibly sell ethanol to California for a few years? Is, is that something that you think is compelling um, reason to build this project? At this time, we haven't taken a position on the public convenience and necessity. As, as to any of the alleged factors that Summit claims um, that will be benefits of this project? I don't think we have a specific position on any of those that they listed in their Exhibit F. Given that we're about midway through at least what's scheduled for this hearing, what more are you going to be looking for that you haven't already heard or haven't already been able to obtain in discovery to weigh in on those factors? I, I don't have an answer for that. I don't know. Well, I mean, if, if, if you still haven't been convinced now such that you haven't been able to make an opinion, would you agree there's, I mean, there's one more summit witness, okay? So would you agree that there isn't going to be any more evidence to push you over the edge if you haven't already concluded uh, that you agree with these alleged benefits? I, I object. State your objection. His, his question presumes that OCA or any party, for that matter, has to take a position on any assertion in a case, and he's leaving out the possibility that we will not take a position on certain factual questions that have been raised in the case. Just as I think other, other parties are not addressing every single issue in the case. They're not required to. I 
don't I'm not sure what that objection was. Um, I'm just reading right off of this gentleman's okay, testimony. You could probably rephrase your question. Sure. Thanks. So starting over, um, you've got an entire section that says promote the public convenience and necessity, and then you cite the Iowa Code. Now, did you did you write this, or did someone else write this for you? I wrote it. All right. So then you, sir, as the OCA representative, certainly would have had the ability and, in fact, made the choice, did you not, to refrain from weighing in on whether or not, based on all the evidence before you and everything you've reviewed, of whether or not this pipeline, in fact, does satisfy the public convenience and necessity standard, right? Can you ask that and uh, rephrase that? I don't sure. understand the sure. question. I'll, I'll try to break it down for you. Um, nowhere in your 23 pages of pre-filed testimony have you made the statement that on behalf of OCA, OCA concludes or believes that based on all of the evidence before you, everything Summit has said and submitted, nowhere does OCA conclude that this project is, in fact, or that it does promote the public convenience and necessity, right? That's correct. As I said before, we didn't take a position on that. And do you plan, does OCA plan to take a position on that or weigh in with any um, argument or facts in any way? I, I honestly don't know. That decision is made above, above my level. Can you think of any possible reason why the state of Iowa would have an Office of Consumer Advocate that would fail to weigh in on the critical question that brings us all here, that being public convenience and necessity? I agree that it's an important question. Okay, and, and I appreciate that statement, but in terms of what I asked you, can you think of any reason why the Office of Consumer Advocate would not weigh in on that question? So the question is, why does the state of Iowa have an Office of Consumer Advocate that does not take a position on public convenience and necessity? Right. That's a, that's a big question, and I don't have an answer for you. I'm sorry. Well, what is the benefit of having an Office of Consumer Advocate and, and taking your time and Iowa taxpayer dollars, I assume, to, to fund salary. Foundation, the taxpayer dollars are being spent from anything OCA is doing in this case. Okay. Well, I, I wasn't finished, but I'll start over. Um, what is the benefit of having OCA involved in this matter if you're not going to weigh in on the ultimate question? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Now you do say, you make, you, at least there's a phrase here on page 21 that says the examples cited by SCS appear to be positive economic benefits for Iowa. Now, did the OCA do a net cost benefit analysis or did you simply look at for instance, we're going to have 20 permanent jobs if we build the project, and then you say, oh, positive economic benefit. How did you do that analysis? That section, uh, lines 12 through 17 of the page on the screen, is based strictly on the job creation from the construction and operation of the pipeline. There, uh, it's not an analysis of any other economic impacts. Whether, whether those impacts be positive or negative, it's not an analysis, correct? It's not an analysis, did you say? Correct. It's simply an assessment that building stuff mm -hmm. creates jobs. Right, and that, of course, in and of itself isn't certainly enough to satisfy public convenience and necessity. You'd, you'd want to look at all the other factors such as the billions of dollars of taxpayer funded tax credits that are 
necessary to make this project go right. Yes, there there is an opportunity to do a more full economic analysis of the entire project. And if we just assume, for instance, that the max capacity would be 18 million metric tons per year multiplied by $85 a metric ton and 45Q tax credits to get us north of $1.5 billion in tax credits, you would agree that it's reasonable that Summit starts out negative $1.5 billion every year if we were doing a net benefit analysis, correct? Um, I'm not sure I understand your question. I'm well, sorry. Well, if the taxpayers, via reduced tax revenue that is necessary to operate this entire country, are essentially kicking in $1.5 billion a year, once, when and if this would ever be built and up to full capacity, you would agree that that would have to be considered an offset with the 20 or so permanent jobs, right? Yeah, I think that should be considered as part of the analysis. Is there any evidence, sir, that OCA attempted to get through a data request from Summit that it has either not received or received what it believed to be inadequate or incomplete answers that is preventing OCA from making any further decisions or opinions as to public convenience and necessity in this docket. I think that we have issued data requests and there's probably opportunities to get a more full understanding of this project, but um, is your question really, did we not always get a complete answer in some of our data requests to? Well, I mean, yeah, my, my question was the one I, one I asked, but what I'm trying to get at is, do you believe that the OCA is in a position based on information it sought and either received or didn't receive that OCA is in a position now and, and following all of the days of testimony to make a decision relative to whether or not this project is in the public's convenience and necessity. I object. State your objection. The, the question goes to legal positions OCA will take, and Mr. Jory will have to wait for our brief. Well, um, any legal position would have to be supported by fact, and I'm asking this gentleman if there's been any facts, i.e. in the way of discovery, that ever, that are missing in his opinion for his analysis. Thank you. Sustained. Go ahead and move on. Okay. Are there any facts that you wished you would have known but did not have prior to preparing your pre-file testimony? I think that there are, um, there could be more information about the economic impacts with regards to the tax credits. And if that information was available, that may have helped you perform a more robust analysis around that issue? Yes. All right, thank you. I, I don't have anything further, sir. Thank you. Mr. Whipple? Mr. Bentz, um, I see that your direct testimony was filed on July 24th. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And I believe as fellow interveners, the county's testimony was filed on the same day. Did you have a chance subsequent to July 24th to review county's witness Hamilton's testimony? Yes, I did. If we could turn to page nine of your direct testimony There is a statement on page nine, lines five and six, with a footnote, number eight, uh, where you accept some of Carbon's statements about county zoning occurring after the project was announced. Having reviewed 
Hamilton's testimony, do you have any changes to make to this testimony today? I don't think I do. I, I would say that that sentence is uh, repeating assertions made by Summit without actually uh, checking them. So it's possible that that's not correct. I believe that topic is addressed in Hamilton's testimony. Do you recall those portions of it? No, I don't. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Benz. Thank you. Mr. Leonard, I think I accidentally stepped over you. I have no questions for this witness, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions for the witness? Okay. Seeing none, Mr. Long. Oh. God dang it. Board. Mr. Benz, on page 12, lines 1 through 2 of your direct. Um, you state Summit Carbon is apparently using its employees as emergency responders and just wanted to clarify if you had concerns with that. I, I don't think we have any concerns with that as long as there's an adequate number of emergency responders. And is it industry practice to use employees as emergency responders? I don't know for sure. Um, on page 17, line 8 of your direct testimony, you use the phrase uncompensated loss. Could you please describe what you mean by that? I think that has to do with the liability insurance issues. Um, and I believe there's been some discussion in the hearing about that. I think that might have to do with indemnification. Okay. Um, on page 21, lines 9 through 11 of your direct testimony, you request further evidence about the long-term economic benefits of the proposed project. Can you give us a definition when you say long-term versus short-term? That sentence uh, relates to what I had mentioned earlier about the potential for the sale of gas-powered motor vehicles to be banned in certain states that also currently have low carbon fuel markets and the potential economic impacts of the sale of fossil fuel vehicles reducing the demand for low carbon ethanol And did that have anything to do with tax credits as well? I think that uh, earlier I mentioned something about the long-term viability of tax credits. I see line eight there. If you scroll up just a little bit. Yeah, the long-term viability of the tax credits. Um, I mentioned earlier the 45Q tax credits, um, the 12-year lifespan. And what kind of a horizon would you prefer to have information on to make a good analysis? I think that, you know, given uh, a pipeline is an asset that can last, uh, as witness Godfrey testified, a uh, hundred years, um, a longer term lifespan uh, for the project would be helpful in justifying the public convenience and necessity. Thank you. No further questions. Mr. Long, any redirect? No, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. 